OK, welcome to System and Devices 1, Lecture 5A, The Computer. This is where we take all those basic building blocks and pull them together into a processor. So in the previous lectures, we've looked at the fundamental building blocks of our computer. So we've looked at the uh, logic gates, we looked at how we could use those to build high-level components like the multiplexer and the adder and our registers. But now we need to consider how we can use those to actually build our computer. How do we actually implement a machine that can execute a program? So a program is just a sequence of instructions, a sequence of operations inside the machine to solve a specific task. Uh, and that is processed by this fundamental uh, block diagram. So, so any computer could be broken down into this block diagram. You have some data processing elements uh, that will be accessing uh, data from memory. And you also have a, a control element that synchronizes uh, the updates to memory and selecting the data processing elements. So this is the system we need to build. Uh, to start off with, I always use the chef analogy. So, so the chef is your control system, the cookbook and the, the larder is your memory, and the bowl and spoon, etc., are your data processing elements. Uh, and the chef's task is to obviously follow the instructions in the cookbook to produce a cake or to solve a problem. So if you break those elements down into different units, uh, so again, following the same color scheme, so blue is control, green is memory, and orange is data processing. Uh, you can consider your computer to be made up of these, these building blocks. You have some instruction memory containing your program. You have uh, some data memory containing the elements you need to process. Uh, and you have a data processing element, which also will, will have some local storage in there as well. Uh, so that's indicated by the bowl in this case here. Uh, and synchronizing all the movements and the operations is our control unit or our chef. So uh, how the system works? Well, the chef uh, chooses the, the program to run, so selects the recipe he wants to do and reads the first instruction from the cookbook. So to process the instructions, the chef follows the fetch decode execute cycles. So during the fetch phase, uh, all the chef is doing is reading the instructions. There's no processing. He's just reading the instruction into his mind, if you want to think of it that way, ready to process it. The next phase is a decode phase. This is where the chef starts to understand what the instruction is actually asking him to do. And then he will fetch the data uh, that needs to be processed, uh, ready to execute it. But again, there's no data being processed at this phase. Finally, we get to the actual processing of the data. So the chef now knows what he has the operation he has to do. He has the, the, the data that he needs to process, uh, so he performs the operation. And in this example here, he's cracking the egg he has got from the larder uh, into the bowl. So when he's finished that instruction, the whole fetch decode execute cycle just repeats as shown in this picture here. So he does a fetch, a decode, and then execute, and then does another fetch, decode, execute. And that is how a computer works. So we break down the problem we're trying to solve into a series of steps, a, a procedure to solve that problem, or what we say an algorithm. A problem may require more than one algorithm, so you may use multiple uh, algorithms in your program. And our program is just a list of instructions to implement that algorithm. And those instructions are performed by the fetch, decode, execute cycle. So from that, we know we need to obviously process instructions inside our machine, but what is an instruction? So if you took a top level view, so this is an instruction. So what we have is an operation to, be, to be performed. Uh, that operation is performed on uh, operands, so the data we need to process. So in this case here, the value is 10 and five. The function that we'll be performing on that data uh, is the opcode. Uh, so in this case, it's multiply, and obviously that will generate a result that needs to be stored in memory somewhere. So you can view those instructions at different levels of abstraction. Uh, at the lowest level, the instructions running on the actual processor uh, are the machine code. So the machines will be using, obviously, a working in binaries. Uh, the instructions will be encoded as a binary pattern. So the simple CPU, uh, this binary pattern here is add 17 to the accumulator. So this is the opcode and this is the operand, the value 17 uh, that we'll be processing. Uh, in general, machine code is specific to one processor. Sometimes they are shared across a processor family, but it's normally unique to a, a the processor. And it's the low level representation uh, of the instruction that the processor actually processes and understands. However, for obviously a, a human operator, the, this string of ones and zeros uh, is a little bit uh, hard to understand. So what we tend to do is give that a textual representation. And that's what assembly language is. So it's a one to one relationship. So one assembly language instruction uh, represents one machine code instruction. So here you can see add uh, 11 hexadecimal it is the same as the previous one. So add here is represented by the opcode field here in the instruction. We'll see that later as we go through how we encode our instructions. Then 17, obviously 11 hexadecimal base 16 is this value, this part here of the instruction. Finally, we have a high level representation. So this is what you normally would program in, in your Python, Java or C, whatever it may be. Uh, so it's a high level representation of what you want the processor to do. Uh, so here we've got a kind of high level if statement there. So if A equals B, then increment C. Uh, that will be made up of obviously multiple uh, assembly language instructions or obviously multiple machine code instructions. 
Uh, so you'd have a, a series of uh, assembly language instructions that would do the comparison, uh, the increment, the decision making in that statement. And obviously the great advantage of working at the, this high level is that the programmer has to write less code because uh, obviously if we pass over the, the complexity of converting what we want to do as described by this high level syntax down into the machine code uh, to the assembler and the compiler. Fundamentally, there are three types of instructions. Uh, those are, are instructions that move data around the machine. So to read and write to memory or read and write to internal storage within the processor, the, the registers. Uh, the number crunch instructions. So you've got your arithmetic instructions. So add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever it may be. And we also have uh, bitwise operators as well. So uh, as we saw in the previous lecture, so bitwise ands, ors, etc. Uh, finally, we have a control group of instructions. So, so these allow us to implement our software structures. So ifs, whiles, fors, whatever they may be basically to change the sequential flow of the instruction. We're not just uh, processing basic blocks of code, We're, we've got loops within our program. Another thing to consider is how these instructions actually access their data or access the, their operands. And we call that the addressing mode. Uh, so there's different ways of accessing the data. Initially, we're gonna stick with some simple ones, uh, implicit, immediate, and absolute. We'll be looking at these uh, in more detail later in the lecture, but implicit and immediate, the the operands, the data on processing, are hard-coded within the instruction, and absolute, uh, the data on processing is stored out in external memory. So at this point, we have some design decisions to make. So what instructions do we want our processor to use? Uh, that's very much dependent on its application domain, what type of tasks it will be doing. Uh, for the simple CPU, uh, they're simple instructions, and we have 11 basic instructions. And I've arranged them here loosely by their addressing mode. So we have some uh, immediate instructions, absolute, and our direct addressing mode instructions. So in this table, we have the assembly language syntax, we have the RTL syntax or the register transfer level descriptions. The binary encoding showing the different uh, bit fields. So we've got opcodes uh, and operands and, and examples of how they would be used uh, in, in a program. So let's have a look at these in more detail. So for our immediate addressing mode instructions, the data we'll be processing is hard-coded in the actual instruction. So this, this bit field here is indicated with the Ks, so it's an 8-bit uh, constant value. So we have four different instructions and their operations are described using this RTL syntax. So when you see this arrow symbol, read it as update. So the accumulator is updated by uh, a value, in this case 12, and that 12 is encoded as an 8-bit value here. So as discussed before, the accumulator is our general purpose data register, and for an accumulator-based architecture, one of the operands is always implicit. It's, it's always the accumulator. And we can see that in these instructions here. So you can see for the add instruction, uh, one of the operands is defined in the instructions, so that immediate value. So the, uh, the hexadecimal 34 would be stored in, in these eight bits. Uh, the other operand is, is the accumulator. So we're adding 34 to the accumulator, updating the accumulator uh, with that result. Subtraction the same, so you've got the accumulator minus the constant defined in the instruction, and exactly the same for the bitwise and. So you can see for each instruction we have a unique opcode, because that's obviously how the, the processor identifies what it has to do by looking at these top four bits, and the data is defined in the lower eight bits. At the moment these middle four bits aren't used, but we'll be using those in later versions of the processor. To help identify what the instruction is when you look at the machine code, the top two bits for immediate instructions are always zero, zero. Okay, the next set of instructions use the absolute addressing mode. So these instructions will be accessing memory. So you've got instructions that will either read memory, write to memory, or process data stored out in memory. So the memory location that you'll be accessing is specified by the lower eight bits. So you've got an eight bit address there. Again, the opcode is specified by the top four bits. So you can see here in the RTL description, uh, for the load instruction that reads memory, the accumulator is updated by M is memory, so you retreat memory in RTL syntax as an array, so you may be familiar with these square brackets. So this is saying uh, whatever data is stored in memory location, hex decimal 9a is read and used to update the accumulator. Obviously the store instruction is just the opposite direction, so whatever data is stored in the accumulator is written to uh, memory at address 9a. The add and subtract instructions here, uh, one of the operands is coming from memory now. So again, as previously stated, accumulator-based architecture, so one of the operands is always the accumulator, but the second operand is coming from memory in this case here. So it's performing a read, so it reads the data at that location and then adds, adds it to the accumulator and updates the accumulator with uh, that new result. And the same for subtract, it does also does the subtraction. Again, notice that all the opcodes are unique, so the person can identify what the instruction is. And again, to help you when you're looking at the actual machine code, the top two bits for the absolute addressing mode are set to the value 0, 1. The final group of instructions uh, are control instructions, so our jump instructions that help us implement our if and while loops. These can be broken down into two groups, so we have unconditional jumps and conditional jumps. 
So the unconditional jump will cause the processor to jump to a specified address. Again, that address is specified uh, in the lower eight bits of the instruction. The conditional jump instructions are conditional on the result of the accumulator. So is the accumulator zero or is it not zero? And you can see that's defined again in the RTL description. So here, if the, the accumulator is zero, then the jump is taken. Otherwise, the processor just fetches the next sequential instruction. And here we have accumulator is not zero. Otherwise, again, it's just the next sequential instruction. Radio to see if that made sense, uh, a quick quiz. So what we've got here is some instructions in machine code. So your task is to disassemble those machine code instructions into assembler code to identify the function of each of these instructions. So to get you started, uh, we'll look at this first one. So what, what instruction is represented by a string of all zeros? So, so if you go back and look at the instruction types, you can see it's a move instruction. because So the machine code instruction, all zeros, will load the accumulator with the value zero. So repeat that process for each of the following instructions and identify what they do do. As always, the answers are on the module web page. Okay, so we've defined our instructions and we have looked at how the process performs a fetch decode execute cycle, but how do you actually implement that in hardware? Uh, and that, it does that for using the connecting buses. So our address, our data and our control bus. So here's our processor, our simple CPU connected to the memory uh, using these buses. So the address bus is just a group of wires defining what memory location I want to access, either reading or writing. Uh, so, the, so the more wires you have, the more memory locations you can specify. So for the simple CPU, it has an 8-bit address bus, so we can specify 2 to the 8 or 256 storage locations. So if you look at the block diagram, this path here is the address bus, uh, an 8-bit bus specifying which memory location I'll be accessing in memory. Once the memory knows which memory location you'll be accessing, Obviously, then we need to transfer that data to the processor or the processor needs to write data to the memory, depending if we're doing a load or store instruction. And this data is transferred across the data bus. In some textbooks, you'll see the data bus uh, as a bidirectional bus. The simple CPU, however, uses a unidirectional buses. So it has two buses for either data coming out of the processor and it has a different bus for data coming into the processor. And the reason for that is that mainly due to the FPGA implementation. So inside the FPGA, uh, bidirectional buses are, aren't commonly used. If you'd like more information on uh, unidirectional bidirectional buses, uh, have a look at the, the Simple CPU webpage. There's a discussion of it on there. And again, the data buses are just a collection of wires. In this case here, there's 16 bits. So we can transfer 16 bit values at one time. The more bits you have, the more data you can transfer in each memory transaction, incre increasing your transfer rate or bandwidth. So again, the block diagram you can see we have at the bottom here is the data out bus going to memory, allowing us to store the accumulator value to memory. And when we do a load instruction, the top bus is the data in bus, allowing us to read memory and store uh, that data either into the instruction register if we're doing a fetch or to route that data into the accumulator if we're doing a load instruction. The final bus we have is the control bus. And the control bus synchronized to transfer between the processor and the RAM and also lets the the memory know what type of memory operation we're doing. Are we doing a read or are we doing a write? For the simple CPU, the control bus is three wires. We have, we have a random access memory uh, enable, RAM enable, or we have a read only memory enable, ROM enable, and a RAM write enable signal. However, as we've only got one memory device in our system, we don't actually need the enable signals because we don't need to select between two different memory devices. Uh, so the system just uses the write enable signal. Uh, so when the, the write enable signal is a, a 1, uh, the memory knows that I'm doing a write, and when it's a 0, it knows I'm doing a read. If you look back at the block diagram, we can see that signal down the bottom here. So a first example, so this is first example is multiplication through repeated addition. So we have the pseudo code here. So we have is our total, uh, our multiplier, our count, how many times we're going to do the addition. We've got a while loop here. Uh, so we keep adding 10 to the total uh, and then decrementing the count, the multiplier, until we've, in this case here, done 10 plus 10 plus 10. So this pseudocode is implemented by this assembly language program, you can see here, are variables are stored in memory. So you can see we have the, the constant zero and three here. So zero, three. So total is stored at address D and our count is stored at address E. Now we've got the main loop of the program. So each instruction takes one memory location so that this will start at address zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So here we have a test to see if the accumulator is zero. So our count, is it zero? If it is zero, then we exit the program uh, and we jump to address 12 or C. Uh, so exit the, exit the loop. So in the accumulator at the moment is the count variable, because that's the last one we wrote to the accumulator with the move instruction here. So we're going to decrement that by one. 
and uh, store that out to memory, updating the count. Then we're going to load in uh, the, the total, uh, so the current uh, total stored at address D. So we read memory, read that into the accumulator, and we're going to add 10 to it and write it back out to address D. Then we're going to load the counter back in and jump back up to address 4, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and test to see if the count is 0. Uh, obviously it's not, so we're going to decrement again and go round until it is, and then exit out the program. Okay, something to note, uh, if this is your first time looking at assembly language, it can be a bit daunting, but do step through it. So do start to think about how you can translate this high-level description of what you want to do into this low-level implementation. Now, it doesn't matter what processor you're using, you're always constrained by the instruction set of that processor. Whatever you want to do, you have to build it out of those instructions. Therefore, you need to have a good understanding of what each instruction does do on the processor. And that only comes about by looking at its RTL description, its register transfer level descriptions. One common misunderstanding when reading assembly code is the difference between move instructions and stores and loads. So when you see a move instruction, always remember this is setting the accumulator to a constant value. So th think about it as copy the constant, in this case zero, into the accumulator. So it's an internal operation, whereas stores and loads are external operations. So these instructions either read external memory, storing the data it's read into the accumulator, or write the accumulator's value to an external memory location. Now we can implement this program either on the breadboarded version of the simple CPU processor or in an FPGA. To show this program in operation, I have a video of it running on the breadboard version from last year's lecture. So I've got various hardware elements in the system. So down the bottom here, this is the accumulator. <coughs> This is the status, the control showing where I'm doing a fetch, decode, or execute when the illuminated LED is on. So that one at loads on, so it's fetch. That one's on, it's decode, and that one's execute. Decoder showing you the instruction that is being processed at the moment. One hot uh, decoded value. Here's the address bus that I'm reading. Uh, here is the data bus, so the 8 bits lower, 8 bit higher of the 16 bits that I'm reading at the machine. If I then step through, you can see the program executing the multiply uh, program. Uh, uh, what well, you should be able to do, I'll just shove it onto auto. So the address there is changing, and this is the accumulator going through. So there's, oh, I'll just pause it. I'll show you a bit slow there. So one, two, four, eight. So the value 10. I'm going to keep adding 10 to it, so I keep going through. Did you see, see that it's moved along? So 10 plus 10 is 20. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So 16 and a 4 give me 20. Adding two things together is the same as multiplying by 2. Multiplying by 2 shifts the bit pattern to the left. I keep going round my program. And eventually you'll get the result. So what's that value there? So I've got a 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So 16 plus an 8 plus a 4 plus a 2 gives me 30, which is the result that we were going for on the program there. There's also another video of this program running on the breadboarded version of the Simple CPU's web page. So do go and look at that web page if you'd like a little bit more detail about this particular piece of code. So hopefully now you've got a basic idea how that program actually works, but what actually is happening inside the processor? What other operations, what housekeeping operations do we need to do to actually implement the fetch, decode, execute cycle to actually uh, process those instructions? Also, we need to consider how we're actually going to load that machine code into this memory. Uh, for the simple CPU, uh, that's a Python assembler. So we store our program in a text file and then they pass that to a Python assembler, which will generate the required machine code. So you can see here, so this uh, program here is converted into these ones and zeros, which are then loaded into the FPGA. As always, there's a web page about that. So if you go to the Simple CPU web page at link here, you can get a little bit more detail about the process of converting our assembly language program down into the machine code. So there's discussion about the instruction formats and what output formats I need, how that is transferred into the EEPROMs, the electrically programmable read-only memories used in the breaded boarded versions, and how it's converted into the text files needed to integrate in with the ISC FPGA tools. Also, there's the Python code of the assembler, so you can see it's not exactly a huge program. Uh, the output form is produced, and the M4P processor we'll be using in later labs. So one thing to note, the first version of the assembly we'll be using has some fundamental limitation and flaws, and over a series of labs, we'll be adding functionality to the assembler to help remove those. Okay, so now that we've got everything set up, we're going to look in detail at actually the internal steps that are happening inside the processor. 
So going back to our chef analogy, so this is the first thing we have to do. So in the fetch phase, we get the instruction to process. So to identify where the instruction is in memory, we have a register, the program counter. So the, the address stored in the program counter is the address of the instruction that I need to fetch. So I read memory, uh, and obviously the data I read from memory has to go somewhere, and we store that into the instruction register inside the processor. And that is the fetch completed. We then go on to the decode phase. So in the decode phase, uh, we look at the instruction register. So we look at the opcode field in the instruction register, so the top four bits. And from that 4-bit value, we identify what the instruction is and what data we need to fetch. Once we've set up the system, uh, we then execute that instruction, so perform the calculation and store any results produced. And then the whole process repeats. We're not going to have a look in detail of actually how we do that step by step on the processor. We could do that in a number of different ways, uh, but to start off with, we can use CPU SIM. And what CPU SIM allows you to do is step through each machine level instruction at the micro instruction level. Uh, so a machine level instruction is our move, our store, our add or subtract, for example. Uh, and inside the machine, they're broken down into a series of steps. And each of those steps is called a micro instruction. So if you take that view of the processor, you can actually simplify it down to this simple block diagrams. All you have are the memory elements in the system. Everything else uh, can be removed. So we've got the program counter, the instruction register, the accumulator, and obviously our main external memory. The arrows show the interconnects between them, so if they can communicate. So you can see here, for example, that you cannot write the, the value in the accumulator to the program counter, but you can write it obviously to memory. We'll be using CPU SIM in a couple of labs to, to develop the instruction set of the simple CPU. You can also download the simulator from this address here. You'll need version 4. It can be a little bit fiddly to install sometimes if you haven't got the right version of Java, but you're looking at 1.8 and the Java FX package. They're the two core requirements. So once you've got CPU SIM downloaded, you can open that up and we'll develop a model of the simple CPU. And then we can use this simulator to see how it would operate. So here we have again our multiply program. Uh, we can assemble that one and load it into memory. So here's the memory, here's all the machine code. And as I step through, you'll see the internal registers update as the program executes its program. So if I step through a couple of instructions, the first one obviously just doesn't moves into a zero, so you don't actually see anything. Uh, but if we go through a little bit further, when we get to the move three, you'll see three gets loaded into the accumulator and then it will get written out to address E. So you'll see this update to the value three. And you can step through the program and see how it operates to make sure you understand what's going on. Again, if you've got space on your home PC, I'd recommend you download this program as it'll allow you to go through the labs in your own time. Okay, quick quiz, slightly chucking you in at the deep end here, but thinking back to that state diagram we had of the fetch decode execute cycle and the RTL descriptions of our different instructions, can you write out the RTL code for the fetch phase, the decode phase, and the execute phase for the move instruction? So you need to think about what information you'll need during the fetch phase, so what address I'll be reading, where it's stored in the machine, how the state of the processor will be updated when the instruction is executed. And to help you with that, there's some examples of RTL type operations here. Do have a think about this one. Uh, you may want to stop the video because the answer follows. So what we have here is the fetch phase. So you can see the, uh, the memory is indexed by the program counter. You read the data at that location, and that is used to update the instruction register. Then we increment the program counter to the next count value, and then we decode the instruction. Uh, when, we, when we decode the instruction, we identify it's the move instruction uh, by looking at the opcode values. Then we run the micro instructions associated with that function. We can break that one down further by looking at how those micro instructions are performed during each phase of the fetch decode execute cycle. So initially at power up, uh, the, the process is reset. So uh, we pulse the clear lines and all the register elements in our system go to zero. So the instruction register, the program counter and the accumulator. Therefore, as the program counter contains the address of the instruction I'll be fetching, the first address fetched is at address zero. So that address there is routed through the address multiplex onto the address bus so that we can access address zero. The data stored at that address is read on the data in bus and then stored into the instruction register. Uh, if you look back at the previous slide, you'll see the, the bit pattern uh, for the move zero instruction. So the opcode for move is zero, the data, the operand is zero. So all zeros is the instruction move zero. Uh, then we move on to the, the decode phase. So in the decode phase, the control logic looks at the top four bits, the opcode field of the instruction. It identifies it's a move instruction. Uh, therefore, it will set up the, the data multiplexer uh, to route uh, the operand zero through the data multiplex. So it'll set up the ALU just to be passed through. I'll pass through that. So that sits on the input of the accumulator, but we haven't updated it yet. As we saw in the previous RTL description, we also increment the program counter to the next count value. So that goes to the value one. The decode phase is now finished. So we go on to the execution phase. 
and the execution phase just loads that data into the accumulator. So as it already contained the value zero, you don't actually see any changes on this slide. So move zero is not the best example. So what would actually change in the processor if we did move three instead? So how will the instruction register change? What will be stored in there? What will be stored in the accumulator as that instruction is executed? Another thing to think about is what happens if the program starts too early before the program has been loaded into memory. So the memory will be blank, it just contains all zeros. What will the processor do? You may want to pause the video and have a think about these ones. Answers are on the module webpage. So just to emphasize that the processor can't tell if the memory contains instruction or not. If you had a memory that was blank, contained all zeros, the processor would constantly execute the instruction move zero because that's the same bit pattern as all zeros. Okay, so that was an example of an, an immediate instruction. So move zero, uh, immediate type instruction. We'll also look at uh, an absolute instruction. So uh, type one instruction. So the format of the instruction is described here in CPU sim. So again, you've got four bit opcode, four bits not used and an eight bit address. The micro instructions that actually implement the load instruction are shown in CPU sim here. So you can see the address stored in the instruction register is put onto the address bus, then we read memory and the accumulator is updated with the data of read. If we break that down again into the block diagram, uh, so again, we're going to fetch an instruction. So we're going to fetch the instruction at address seven, uh, a load instruction. So address seven comes out of the program counter, goes onto the address bus. So now we can load that instruction that is then loaded into the instruction register. Again, if you look at the definitions of the instructions, at the load instruction, you'll see it's opcode 4, and obviously the address we want to access is address D, as given in the instruction here. So at the end of the fetch phase, we have the instruction loaded in the instruction register. We go on to the decode phase. Again, the control logic looks at the top four bits, sees it has the value 4, so it identifies the load instruction. Therefore, it knows it needs to route the address, uh, the value D, from the instruction register onto the address bus. So it sets up the address multiplexer to route that value D onto there. It'll then read that memory location. So that memory location is the value zero, so that will be coming in on the data in bus. It will then configure the data multiplexer to pass this value to the ALU. The ALU is configured to just, to, again, to be passed through. So the value zero will be on the output of the ALU. And when we move to the execute phase, that value will be loaded into the accumulator. OK, another quick quiz to see if you understand what's going on. What will happen in the machine when we execute the add instruction? So when we add 10 to the accumulator. So first of all, you have to identify what type of instruction is. So go back, have a look. You'll see, ah, oh, right, it's an add instruction. It's an add immediate instruction. So it will be similar to, so it'll be similar to the move instruction, but obviously we'll perform an add. You can take this quiz a little bit further if you want to as well. There's also another type of add instruction. There's add M, a memory add, which uses the absolute addressing mode. That instruction is not used in, in this program, but consider how that would be executed on this machine. And just to give you a hint, it's a, it's a combination of a load instruction and a add instruction. If you're not sure, go back and look at the CPU sim lab script where we actually implemented these, these instructions. OK, so the next instruction we'll look at is our control instructions, our jump instructions. Uh, so here we've got, uh, again, the format for an unconditional jump. So it's the same format. So you've got opcode, not used, and an address that you'll be jumping to. Again, in CPU sim, the RTL micro instruction description is given here. So you can see for the unconditional jump, all we do is load the address stored in the instruction uh, into the program counter. Breaking that one down further in the block diagram, so we're going to fetch the unconditional jump at address 11. So obviously 11 hexadecimal B, so the address from the program counter routes through onto the address bus through the address multiplexer. We read the machine code at that address that gets fed through and stored into the instruction register. Again, if you go look back and look at the bit fields for the jump instruction, you'll see the opcode value for an unconditional jump is 8 and we'll be jumping to address 4 as defined here. So that's the end of the fetch. Deco phase again looks at the top four bits, sees it's a value eight, so it knows it needs to update the program counter. So the jump address is passed through from the instruction register into the program counter. Program counter is updated uh, with the new value uh, in the execution phase. So that when I start the next fetch decode execute cycle, I will be fetching the address at address four. So it's jumped from this one back up to this one here. So an instruction can be viewed at different ways. You can think of an instruction as just something that tells the processor what to do. But hopefully when you look at how those micro instructions are performed on the processor, those RTL descriptions, you'll see that during the fetch decode execute phase, you're actually reconfiguring the data paths within the processor. So you're switching the address multiplexer, the data multiplexer, the ALU to perform different functions. So you're reconfiguring the hardware for each instruction. So think of the processor as a general purpose processing machine and each instruction reconfigures it to perform a specific task. And that's similar to the kind of philosophy taken for the Intel 4004. So again, they, they could have designed a range of ASIC, so application specific integrated circuits, but they decided to design a more flexible system. So something that could be reconfigured to perform different tasks 
And effectively, that's what you're doing every time you execute an instruction, reconfiguring the processor to perform a different task. Again, you can download this example from the VLE. So there's an ISC project with a simple CPU and it's memory configured to perform this multiplication algorithm. Uh, you can run that through the simulator and you can see uh, how the address bus, data bus, and the internal registers are changed as it executes that program. And running at 10 megs, it takes about 140 microseconds to perform that calculation. Okay, finish off. So we looked at the fetch decode execute cycle. So how an instruction is represented inside the processor in, in memory, how that is then processed by the processor, how we could represent instructions at different levels of abstraction. So from high level to assembler to machine code and breaking that one down further and seeing how these machine level instructions are actually uh, implemented in the hardware as a series of steps, a series of micro instructions. And we'll continue in lecture 5b where we'll look at how we actually implement this in hardware using the components we designed in the previous lectures.